Barium iodide. Okay. Let's keep going. Oops, it's not real. Hold on. This one. Chromium what? Nope, not quite. Which group does this one fall in? This is a, is this, well, first of all, is it ionic? Does it fit into the ones that we've been talking about so far? It does, because it's got a metal involved. Anytime there's a metal involved, you can assume it's ionic. So then we say, okay, so is it the type 1? Which is the metal that can only have one flexible charge? No, oh, thanks. Is it the type 1 or is it type 2 where the metal can have more than one flexible charge? 2. It's 2. So what is the charge and how do you know? Plus 30. Well, well maybe. No, actually, but <laughs> close, actually, yeah. <laughs> Let's look at that then. To figure this one out, so that's sort of the logic you use. First, is it ionic? Well, there's a metal. Yes. Second, can that metal have different oxidation states? You look up at the periodic table. If it's somewhere in that middle, which it is, right, number 24, um, then yes, it can have different oxidation states, except for the, the exceptions of um, silver and zinc. So then you say, yeah. It's a little stupid, but how do you know if it's ionic? Uh, to see if it's ionic, it usually means that there's one metal and one non-metal. Okay. Or actually, you can even look simply, you can just look for metals. Because unless it's just a metal, that'll tell you too. So, so if it has something to the left of that line, there's a good chance it is um, ionic. All right, so then you have to figure out, so far now, we know that it's something like this. Chromium something oxide. So we have to figure out what that charge on chromium is. And to do that, we have to look at the oxygen. So oxide always has the same charge. What is it? Minus two. Minus two. Oxide is always minus two. So if each oxygen there is minus two, then what does chromium need to be to balance that out? Well, each oxygen is minus two. How many oxygens are there? Three. So the overall negative charge in that molecule is six, which means chromium needs to be plus six to balance that out. So this would be chromium six oxide. Yeah. Um, when I was in chemistry last, well, I'm sure we'll get to this point, but like um, how you would figure out what the charge is, how you would cross them. So t is it technically like two and six, and then it's just divided? Like, is that what it is? Like, it's Cr plus six O minus two. Mm -hmm. So is that what it essentially yeah. is? Like, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Oxide is always minus two. Yeah. And so chromium needs to be plus six, so that you have three minus twos equals minus six, right? Three times minus two. That's the overall negative charge. Yeah. And then you need plus six to balance that out. But do you know what I'm saying? Like when, like to figure out how many, you, okay, like when you cross, like, can I draw it? Sure. Okay. Yeah, please, because I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Here, you can do it on the computer, sir. Oh, okay. Like on the computer? Yeah. So, um, this is... And you just cross it like that, but since it's six, I don't understand what the crossing is for. So that's what I learned in okay. in chemistry, like um, to w when you figure out what the charge is, like on something. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like that's how they I don't taught. Know what those arrows are, are showing. Like to break, so then it would it would be like um, oh six. That's supposed to be a six. Yeah. 
So is that, is it, never mind. Okay. Yes, I think you're right, but I think, <laughs> And then yes. because it's two and six, it goes to three and one. Like, so yes. that it, it's. Yes, 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 okay, yes. That's supposed to be an R. I understand now, okay, yes, three. absolutely. So you're going, what's happening here, you're going the other way in this question, right? So like if I said, draw the formula for chromium six oxide, you would use that to figure out how many like how what it looks like. Yes. Okay. So, okay. I, so because it's two and six, it just goes down to three and one because they go into okay. each other, right? Like is that what? Yeah. Is that am I right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So if that helped anyone, good. If that confused you, we'll get. Don't worry about it. There are other ways. That's fine. No, thank you. Thank you for explaining it. I, I do understand that now. Um, all right. Let's try another one in a similar vein. And then we'll try some the other way, too. What do you call that one? Copper. Copper nitrate. Copper nitrate is part of it. Copper two nitrate. How did you know that it was two? Those of you who knew it was two. Yeah, because nitrate ion is NO3 minus. And there are two of them. So that means an overall minus two charge that has to be balanced by plus two. There's no shortcut or there's no tricks here. If you don't know what nitrate is and you don't know that nitrate has a minus one charge, you're not going to get that. So that's why it's really important to learn all those polyatomic ions. Um, let's do a similar one, but go the other way. How about um, zinc sulfite? See if you can write something down. Commit yourself to an answer so you can be honest whether you whether or not you actually know this. What do you think? Got one? Maybe? It's ZNSO3. ZNSO3. What do you think about that? Does that seem right? Wrong? Disagree? What do you think? It's ZNSO4. ZNSO4? SO4 is sulfate. What do you think? Anybody get something different? So, okay, who thinks it's the first one? Okay, okay. who thinks it's the second one? All right, who has no idea? All right, good. Uh, I mean, thanks for being honest. <laughs> Not good, right? Thanks for being honest. The, um, okay, it is the first one. It is the first one. Okay, let's break this down. How do we figure this out? First, zinc is one of the exceptions to the stuff in the middle rule. Zinc is always plus two. Always plus two. Oh, so the twos cancel out. So that's, yeah, what? So the twos cancel out. So we don't say zinc two sulfite, we just say zinc sulfite. So that's another ion, you just need to know zinc is plus two. And then sulfite is SO3 two minus. Sulfate is SO4 two minus. So this one here, is zinc sulfate. All right, let's keep going. How about T 
tin four oxide. And actually, I did this wrong. Everybody pay attention to this for a second. Um, make sure that you always start the names of chemicals with a lowercase letter, unless they're at the beginning of sentences. Elements, compounds, any of that kind of stuff, chemicals, they're not proper nouns, so we don't capitalize them. Tin four oxide. What is TI? Yeah, titanium. SNO2. SN2O3 would be if it's tin 3 oxide. Because then you'd need to balance them that way. All right, continuing. Strontium. Carbonate. Strong opinions one way or the other on SrCO3 being strontium carbonate? Is strontium plus two? What do you think? Why? Yeah, it's in the second column, so you can usually assume that those are going to be plus two. So, yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. SrCO3. Again, you need to know strontium is Sr. You need to know that's 2 plus from being in the second column. And carbonate is CO3, 2 minus. So those balance out. That's overall neutral. OK, we'll come back and do plenty more of these. And then the lab tomorrow gives you a lot more practice with this naming, too, um, as you'll see. But let's go on and talk a little bit about the other class of compounds, which is the covalent compounds. Okay, so covalent compounds, we'll get into the whole theory of bonding or whatever, but they're atoms where the electrons are shared rather than transferred, and they don't have ions in them. They're not ionic. They don't have plus and minus ions. Um, however, they still do have oxidation states, meaning they are missing or have too many electrons, and therefore you can talk about um, balancing that. We'll get into that later in the semester. For us now, we need to talk about naming. Now, naming for covalent compounds, once you've identified it as a covalent compound, is actually, I think, a lot easier. Um, covalent compounds are generally just made of the nonmetals, so stuff in that right side. And you simply name them kind of as explicitly as possible. There's no short 
tricks or ways you're supposed to shorten it, or you just say how many of this there are and how many of this there are. Okay. <laughs> Example. We'll get in these and I'll, we'll go back and talk about some of the exceptions. So a compound of NO is, we can recognize that as covalent because it doesn't have any metals in it. So the nitrogen and the oxygen are going to be sharing their electrons. So if we have something like N2O, we say, okay, there's two nitrogens, there's one oxygen, there's one oxygen. The name of that then is dinitrogen monoxide. Right? So however many nitrogens there are, however many oxygens there are. The only thing then to watch out for are these couple sentences here. You don't say mono for the first one. So, you, so CO is carbon monoxide, not monocarbon monoxide. And SiO2 would be silicon dioxide, not monosilicon dioxide. Same thing down here. If there's just one at the beginning, it's nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide. You don't say mono for the first one. Um, but you do for the next one. So that's it. You just say it. You just put in exactly what is there. Uh, you just have to know what those prefixes are. So N2O3, what would that be? Right. Dinitrogen trioxide. And then what about N2O5? Yeah. Dinitrogen pentoxide or pentaoxide. might just be pentoxide. I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter. Pentoxide? All right, we'll keep it that. And then these have some common names like nitrous oxide, nitric oxide. Um, it's probably worth your while to know what those are, but the important thing is to be able to name these things systematically. OK, and then as we said, these prefixes are only used when there is no metal present. And that's one of. I would say the number one errors that I see on naming on exams and quizzes is putting these prefix in, prefixes into the type 1 stuff. Because it's a lot easier to name stuff this way. So people will go back up to like CRO3 and call that chromium trioxide. right? But that's not correct because that doesn't show that this is ionic. This is correctly named chromium 6 oxide. If it were chromium trioxide, you would assume that it's covalent. Right. So, and there will be some crossover there as you go on in chemistry and find some other stuff. But um, for now, let's stick to those rules. So your first, again, let's look at the procedure here. Your first thing is determine whether it's a metal or a nonmetal. That tells you whether or not to use these prefixes. If it's a nonmetal, then you use these prefixes. So let's practice a little bit. P4O10. Yeah. Tetra phosphorus deca oxide or deca oxide. I think this one's deca oxide, but I, it doesn't really matter. NB2O5. Don't get tricked. It's not dye. Why is it not dye? Because it's a metal. Right, it's a metal. It's in that middle bit. So it is. So this goes, this is, was thrown in there to kind of, you know, not get tricked. Um, yeah, so this is niobium. 5 oxide.
All right. Let's actually skip to D because C is a little bit special. Skip to D. How would you name D? It's like a metal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Titanium four. Nitrate. Okay. Let's go back to that C. This one, I'm just gonna tell you, is tricky. If I just let you do it, I think 100% of you would do it wrong. Which is why we're going to talk about it. What's tricky about it? See, let's see if we can figure that out. Why is this not what you think it might be? And the way to figure that out is kind of do it two steps. Name it the way you think it should be named. All right. And then pretend you didn't see that and you had to draw the formula for what you just named. You know what I'm saying? So like, we could, I guess we can kind of do that together. What do you think it should be named? Lithium oxide, right? Or lithium, what? Lithium uh, two oxide? What's wrong with that? Yeah, lithium can only be plus one. Lithium can only be plus one because it's in that first row. So it can't be lithium oxide. It can't be lithium oxide because lithium oxide would be Li2O. Because oxide is, o, is 2 minus, and lithium has to be plus 1. So the only way to get them to balance out is Li2O. And it can't be lithium 2 oxide, because lithium can only be plus 1. So what's going on here? Is it a typo or something? Yeah, probably not, but yeah. This is actually one of the ions on your list of anions to know. And it's a tricky one. But O2, 2 minus, is peroxide. It's a different ion. Right, it's one of the polyatomic ions, O2, 2 minus peroxide. And the good thing about it is it doesn't come up a whole lot. It's usually not in a counter ion with anything else um, but, but simple alkali or alkaline earth metals. So you don't have to worry about it because if it were something like with a transition metal, there would be no way to know that it was peroxide because you're counting on that oxygen to tell you the charge is metal. So the only way you can tell that is if the, the metal has a known charge. So that one was put in there to be a little bit tricky. So it's lithium peroxide. Well, let's be clear about that. It's not lithium oxide. It's lithium peroxide. All right, and we did a little bit of this too. Formulas from names. Let's uh, let's practice that. Now see if you can get those get those on your own. The formulas. And then we'll go on and talk about acids. OK, vanadium 5 fluoride this is going to be VF5. OK, we know those ones in that column 7A are generally minus 1. So that means that we're going to need five of them to counteract that plus 5 from vanadium. Dioxygen difluoride, O2F2. See, those covalent ones are always the easiest because it tells you exactly how many of each. You don't have to figure anything out. Rubidium peroxide. Right, just like that example that we did, RB2O2. And you have to know that peroxide is a minus 2 anion. And then gallium oxide. GA203. Yeah, GA2O3. That one gets a little bit tricky. Gallium is underneath aluminum. so. You can sort of assume that that's also um, plus three. Now, in real life, gallium has some non-metal properties and stuff as well, and so there's other complications, but that's fine. We'll keep it like that. All right. So how should you practice this? How should you get better at this? 
We'll first make sure you know the naming rules. So go through some of these problems, and we'll have a bunch on Thursday, tomorrow, in lab, with your anion sheet, your periodic table, with the names. So at least you get the rules and you know how to name each type of compound. Then work on the memorization and just do whatever tricks you need, flashcards, carry the paper around with you, whatever you need to get those ones that you don't know into your head. All right, one more type of naming rules, and that's for acids. Acids are named a little bit differently. Some of them you already know, probably. But there are two types of acids that we're going to work on naming. The uh, so-called inorganic acids or, and the oxy acids. So the first type of acids are ones that don't contain oxygen. Here are some examples. HCl, HBr, HI, H2S. I, that one's always on here. I, I don't really consider that an acid. Um, and HCN. The way you name these is with the prefix hydro and the suffix ic and the acid. So HCl is hydrochloric acid. HBr is hydrobromic acid. HI is hydroiodic acid. HCN is hydrocyanic acid. Because cyanide is CN minus. All right, so that's how these things. Now, H2S is not hydrosulfic acid, it, or whatever you call that. It is hydrogen sulfide. It's an inorganic um, nonmetal compound that's common. This is what's responsible for a lot of smells, actually, a lot of bad smells. Things like everything from Rotten eggs to farts has hydrogen sulfide as part of that smell. It's added to gas, like natural gas, so that when you turn your stove on, you can smell it because the gas itself is, is odorless. All right. Just a question. Yeah. Why would it be called dihydrogen sulfide? Um, it, it would be. Yeah, the, the technical uh, proper name should be dihydrogen sulfide. However, it's a common thing, and this is sort of the common name that gets, that gets shortened. Um, the other answer to that is there is no monohydrogen sulfide. So this is the only compound that hydrogen and sulfur make together, and therefore hydrogen sulfide is unambiguous because it can't be anything else. Kind of like um, hydrogen peroxide, same thing, right? It should be dihydrogen peroxide maybe, um, but it's not because there's no monohydrogen peroxide. Okay, um, now, just to get a little bit more into it, these are acids, sure, but is there all, are there also compounds like, like why don't we call HCl hydrogen chloride? Why is, it H, why is it hydrochloric acid? Or are those different things? Or are they the same, different words for the same thing? Hydrogen chloride and hydrochloric acid. You may not have heard of this before. So you've probably always encountered HCl as hydrochloric acid, and, and hopefully you will most of your life. But HCl is actually a gas, hydrogen chloride gas when it's pure. Hydrochloric acid is made, well, it can be made different ways, but hydrochloric acid results from hydrogen chloride gas being dissolved in water. That's why we talk about like concentrated HCl, concentrated hydrochloric acid. That's as much HCl gas as you can get to dissolve in water. And so there is an HCl compound, a gas, hydrogen chloride, that is really dangerous and corrosive and, and terrible. It's the reason you shouldn't mix um, bleach and um, something else, some, some other household. Ammonia, I think, yeah. You mix bleach and ammonia, I believe it produces hydrogen chloride gas kill you, so it can be really dangerous. Um, so the naming stuff, it does actually work. And if you call HCl hydrogen chloride or HBr hydrogen bromide, I mean, that is a compound. That is a gas. But if it's, if it's in a reaction or if it's kind of how we usually experience it, we normally name it as an acid. 
Okay, so now the other type of acids, the oxoacids, or the acids that contain oxygen. This one gets a little bit trickier. You have to know, first you start with the anion. So you have to know what the anion is, and you use that to name the acid. If it's an anion that ends in eight, the acid name becomes ic. If it ends in ite, the acid name becomes us. So there's the rules. You can practice these or go back and review them. But let's look at some examples. Here are a series of acids based on the chlorine oxide anions. So you have a perchlorate anion, and then this acid becomes perchloric acid, a really unpleasant acid that um, can explode. If you have chlorate anion, that becomes chloric acid. So note with these that they don't start with hydrogen. It's not hydroperchloric acid or hydrochloric acid, because hydrochloric acid is something else, right? So it's important that you name it one way or the other, or you're actually saying the wrong thing. If you used hydrochloric acid instead of chloric acid for something, you could really be in trouble, because they certainly have different properties. When we move to the chlorite anion, that becomes chlorous acid. And so what do you think the hypochlorite anion, um, the acid of that, is called? Hypochlorous acid, right. Good. All right, what about this one? Well, what's the anion? First of all, how do you know it's an acid? I guess we didn't even talk about that. How do you know when you look at a molecule that you're supposed to name it like an acid and not one of these other ways? The H, right, yeah. It's got that H there. It starts with the H or has the H prominent. You can be pretty sure that's an acid. So what would you call it? Sulfurous. Sulfurous acid, right. Why isn't it sulfuric acid? It's not sulfuric. Right. This anion is the sulfite anion, not the sulfate anion. Sulfate would be sulfuric acid, but the sulfite gives you sulfurous acid. Okay. What about HNO3? Close. Is nitric acid. Because this anion is nitrate. HNO2 would be nitrous acid. Alright? We'll try let's try one the other way. Draw Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is the major acid in soft drinks and gives rise to the carbon dioxide. Right, so if it's carbon, let's break it down a little bit. Carbonic acid means it comes from what anion? If it's carbonic, Carbon. it comes from carbonate, right? So we draw so you first draw carbonate, CO3 2 minus, yeah, or minus 2. And then if that's carbonate, how many hydrogens do we need to balance that out? Two. So it becomes H2CO3. And that's correct. So you can go from the name to the anion 
and then put the uh, hydrogens on there that are necessary. OK, congratulations. You know how to name everything until you go to organic chemistry and it all changes again. <laughs> all right, let's make a little flow chart here. I think this may be helpful. Maybe not. So we'll start with the first question. Is it ionic or is it covalent? That's the first thing you're going to ask yourself, right? And let's make two tracks. If it's ionic, what's the next question? What do you, if, if something's ionic, I know it's hard to do it in the abstract, but what's the next question you're going to ask to figure out how to name it? What, I mean, what would you do, literally? If, you went, if I gave you one, you know, go back up to the ones we did before, what was the next thing you thought of after you knew it was ionic? So which, group it is. which group it is, right. Um, in the language of the book, it's type 1 or type 2. Maybe it's more clear to say something like, does it have a variable charge or oxidation state? In other words, can it have a... Um, plus, you know, uh, various plus two, plus three, plus four, whatever, or is it fixed? So let's say um, first, yes, it does have a variable charge. Well, that gives you things like this with the parentheses, right? If it doesn't have the variable charge, then you just name it like like that, without the Roman numerals. So that's that type 1, type 2 thing. Either with the Roman numerals, if it can have different charges, or without it, if it can't, if it can only have one charge. All right, now on the other side, if, if it's a covalent compound, if it doesn't have metals in it, what do we ask ourselves next to figure out how to name it? What are kind of the two categories of covalent? Yeah. The ones we just talked about. So is it an acid or not? If it is an acid, then I'll just say use acid rules. We just talked about those. So that would be the like hydrobromic acid or whatever. If it's not an acid, then we use the nonmetal rules of going through and, and calling it everything, right? So something like dinitrogen monoxide. Okay? So your first job with any of these is always to put it in the correct category because many compounds, as we've seen, can be named in any of these categories. And if they're in the wrong category, you're going to get the wrong name. For instance, sodium oxide, if you didn't know that sodium has a fixed charge, you might name it sodium 1 oxide. That would be incorrect because sodium only has the one charge, so you leave the Roman numeral off. Similarly, if you didn't know that was a metal, sodium oxide, by the way, is Na2O. If you didn't know that was an ionic compound of a metal and a nonmetal, you might get off on this track and call it disodium monoxide, and that would also be wrong. So the key to the naming is getting it in the right category. I think you can all do the rules just fine. It's getting it in the right category that usually um, causes the errors. That and not knowing your anions, ultimately. 
OK, should we try a couple more and then get into some mastering chemistry stuff? Yeah. OK. So I'll give you some to name, and then you can have some to uh, write the the formula for. What do you call that one? Yeah, so how did you name it? Okay, good. Let's go through it again. So we figured out through the various tracks that it was in what category? Acid. acid. You know, it's got the H out on front. Um, okay, so if it's an acid, what's the anion? Acetate. Acetate. So then is it hydro... Acetic acid or acetic acid? Acetic. Acetic, why? Right, because it's an anion that ends in 8 and it has oxygen, so you don't name it with the hydro part. And probably you've heard of acetic acid, so. Yeah, acetic acid. Okay, how about this one? It is ionic. How do you know it's ionic? Right. I mean, anything with sodium in it, you can assume it's going to be ionic. What is that ion? Remember, this is your ion, right? What's that called? Or your anion? Hypochlorite. I wrote it OCL instead of CLO, but it's the same thing, right? It's an ion ion that has an O and a CL. This is how this, this compound is more commonly um, written. So this is sodium hypochlorite. Which is the main ingredient in what? You know? Bleach. This is what bleach is. Okay, what about this one? Careful. Yes. Right. So this is a common mistake. There's no charge. This is not an ionic compound. But we're used to seeing SO3 is like an ion, like a sulfur oxygen ion, which is sulfite. But this is not sulfite because it doesn't have a charge. So that makes this a covalent compound. And so its name becomes sulfur trioxide. Okay. How about thallium two sulfide? Thallium is a very 
poisonous metal, um, one of the very worst for you. But it's, it's actually fairly common it's in that same realm of lead and mercury, so things that you can be poisoned by, and arsenic. Um, Sometimes there have been a couple relatively high profile thallium poisonings lately. It's the sort of thing that it actually tastes kind of good, it's a little sweet. So you can put thallium salts in someone's coffee or in someone's food, and they'll just slowly eat it over time and then die. Um, if you think you might be getting thallium poisoned, the ways to tell are it actually is, is um, it's processed through the body out the hair and the fingernails. So your hair starts to fall out, your fingernails start to get kind of grayish and blackish. Um, so if that's happening to you, maybe get checked for some heavy metals. It's also, it, it, it occurs naturally in minerals, so some people have thallium in their water supply, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I did this wrong. This should be thallium-1 sulfide. There is no thallium-2. There's thallium-1 and th thallium-3, but there's no thallium-2. Hmm? No, that would be titanium for sulfide. TL is thallium, that's right. So it is, but not S2. So TL2S. The sulfide under oxide is minus 2. So thallium sulfide. Thallium is down below aluminum, gallium, and indium. Bet right between mercury and lead, so a nice little poison trio there. <laughs> thallium has a plus one. It's thallium one. <coughs> well, there are two oxidation states for thallium. There's thallium one sulfide, which is Tl2S, and there's thallium three sulfide, which is Tl2S or Tl3S2. No, DL2S3. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's take a little break from naming and answer some uh, some other questions. All right. So the mass of an average blueberry is 0.8 grams. The mass of an automobile is 2,100 kilograms. Find the number of automobiles whose total mass is the same as a mole of blueberries. All right. So what do you have to do first? Yeah, you have to figure out how much a mole of blueberry weigh, blueberries weighs. Right? How do you do that? Yeah. Right. So if you have one mole of blueberries, remember it's like a dozen. That means you have this many blueberries. So to figure out how much that many blueberries weighs, you multiply it by the mass of each blueberry. So if each blueberry is 0.8 grams, you got that many blueberries, you multiply those together, that's your, all, your total mass of blueberries. Right? So then you divide that by the mass of an automobile once your units are in the right place, and that's how many automobiles it takes to make that mass. Wait, I'm sorry. So you multiply it, and then you divide by the mass of the automobile? Yeah, well, think about what's going on here. You have that many blueberries. Each one is 0 0.80 grams. So the total mass of that many blueberries, a mole of blueberries, is that number times the mass of each one. And then you, but you have to convert you, kilograms to grams first. Yeah, at some point. You can either do a first or second or whatever. At some point when you're comparing with the automobiles. So then you divide by the automobiles, and that's, that's it. Yeah. OK, so what was the other question, the other one with the question? Gasoline tank. It's 2.32, sorry. 
All right. So how do you figure this one out? An automobile gas tank holds 20 kilograms of gasoline. When the gasoline burns, 83 kilograms of oxygen is consumed, and carbon dioxide and water are produced. What is the total combined mass of carbon dioxide and water that, that is produced? Why? Is that all it is? Yeah. Why? Why is it so simple? Yeah, the, the answer here is actually kind of in the topic of the question, namely the law of conservation of mass. If you have some fuel and you react it with some oxygen, so you burn it, then whatever you produce has to have the same mass as what you started with. Otherwise, you violated the principle of conservation of mass. So if you start with, I don't think I can really talk about this without just telling you how to do it, so that's fine. But if you start with 20 kilograms of gasoline, and you also put in 83 kilograms of oxygen, you have to produce that same mass through the reaction. Otherwise, you violated that principle. So then you just, you just sum it and yeah. that's the answer. Right. Because the, any, any fuel, and you may not know this, but we might as well learn this too. Any kind of hydrocarbon fuel is going to react with some amount of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water if it burns completely. Of course, we know there are a lot of other byproducts because gasoline isn't pure hydrocarbon, but that's the ideal reaction. So whatever the mass of this is has to equal the mass of this so you don't violate that principle. All right, stuff in has to equal stuff out. Otherwise, you've lost or gained mass. What? 32, I think it is. 232. Which one is that? Isn't it just the thickness times the distance? Or right. This is a similar. Yeah. This is a similar question to the blueberry one. You have to figure out how many pennies there are, which is the mole number, Avogadro's number of pennies, and then times each one's length gives you some length in millimeters. Convert that to some other to uh, kilometers. And that's, that's it. So same thing. You're multiplying that, that mole number by each one, by, by one, one millimeter, and then converting to kilometers. Or convert to kilometers first and then multiply. Other questions about these? Yeah. 2.103? 1.15? All right, without doing any calculations, determine which of the following samples contains the greatest amount of the element in moles. How would you do this? Yeah, you're, you're comparing their molar masses. So if you have one mole of each of them, um, what, is, what are the three here? Chromium, look at where they are, chromium, titanium, and zinc. If you had one mole of each of those, the zinc would weigh the most. Zinc would weigh 65, the chromium would weigh 51, titanium would weigh 48 grams. So now if you have this many grams of each of those, you can say, well, whichever, assuming they're comparable, the one with the heaviest molar mass will be um, the fewest moles, and the one with the lightest molar mass will be the greatest amount of moles. And these, these numbers are very similar to the molar masses. So you compare these numbers to those molar masses and see it's right around one, but one of them is going to be a little more than one or a little less than one. They're all a little less than one, yeah. So I'm not going to tell you that answer, but that's how you, the idea is to compare them to the moles. And then this one is basically a trick question, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which contains the greatest mass? And then those are masses. I think that's I think that's a mistake. I don't think they made to, meant to make it that way. I think they meant to have numbers in moles here, but they just put the numbers in mass instead. 
Well, yeah, because you don't think that they would ask you something like that. Yeah, so. All right, we have about uh, seven more minutes. What else would you like to talk about? Anything? Everybody's good? OK, well, we'll have lots of practice with naming and stuff tomorrow. Work on that pre-lab stuff. I'll be around this afternoon if you need anything.